Hi there folks and welcome to another update on the situation in Iceland. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Thanks for joining me. It is November 17th about 11:30 here Mountain Standard Time. Should make it I suppose about 6:30 um, UTC or in Iceland. A um, couple things here. First of all, I want to welcome everyone who's joining us. Uh, appreciate all those who have been encouraging and supporting uh, this effort. This is something I would be do any, doing anyway, is following this closely on my own because I have a vested interest and, and connections with Iceland. Uh, so it seemed quite you know, natural to share that with anyone that was interested. And so I appreciate those that have followed along. Um, I'm going to do, yesterday I tried to do questions at the end and yesterday's update turned out to be long and I heard responses on both ends of the spectrum. Some people thought it was great. Others just wanted me to get right to it. Um, please remember that I'm, I'm, I'm an educator and, and a scientist. I'm not a news agency. Um, that being said, I think it probably is a good idea for me to separate those a little bit. So today I'm going to just put together an update and I hope either later today or maybe this weekend I'll put together a longer video that will include all, just all questions. It'll be a complete question and answer session and that'll allow me to get some stuff ready. So hopefully that'll work for most of us. Uh, one correction I want to make over yesterday's update on November 16th on Thursday is I think I mentioned that they had detected sulfur dioxide magmatic gas through a borehole uh, from the power plant that extended to the east. And I might have said, I think I did say that they had drilled that borehole. That was actually incorrect. It, it was an existing borehole. So it was a borehole that already was there that they were able to uh, put some instruments down or otherwise measure gas in that borehole. It's a, it also was not a production well. So it's not part of generating power or pumping hot water to the surface. It's really just an exploration well that they had drilled about uh, I guess in 2015 2016 and to that end I got I got interested in this well and so I started digging a little bit um, on the internet and I think uh, Amanda Jo helped me out with a couple of these sources so I want to give her a shout out thanks so much for her help in finding some of these but I did find a, a thesis here and I want to just show you where this borehole is um, they've got some maps in here and I was just interested in seeing where the borehole actually was. So here's a map of, there's the Blue Lagoon right there. There's the power plant and their well field, along with a few down here off this road. Uh, there's Thorbjorn, the, the hill. Uh, and then the red lines are uh, angled boreholes. So most of these boreholes are vertical. They go straight down. But those that actually extend in a certain direction have a red line on them. And if we zoom in here a little bit, uh, and bring this over, you'll see that this particular one, SV26, is a borehole. This I'm assuming this was the one. This is a borehole that actually extends uh, off to the east here, and this gets pretty close to that uh, Sundunukur uh, line of craters over in this area. So I believe that was the borehole that was used to measure or to detect the presence of sulfur dioxide. Uh, digging a little bit deeper, I found a report online as well, and I can put links for these on the video description for those that might be interested in, in digging a little further. Uh, a nice summary report that was probably written right after they drilled and completed this well. And if we go to, I think page, not page six, which page is it? Um, this one here actually shows pretty nicely, let me zoom in a little bit for you. Again, SV26, and then here's that borehole extending out to the east. Uh, the crater row is out over here. So they got pretty close. And that borehole, if you kind of get into this report like I did, it was about uh, 2,537 meters in terms of its extent or length or depth, if you want to think of it that way. Um, it is in an orientation that's nearly due east. You can see the trend that it takes. What I couldn't find in the report anywhere was what inclination it followed. So when you drill a, a non-vertical borehole, not only do you have a direction, but you have an inclination. Maybe it's 60 degrees from vertical, maybe it's 45 degrees. And in kind of thumbing through it, I, I didn't see that anywhere. So if anyone knows, uh, that would be of interest to me because then you could actually play some trigonometry games with it and figure out exactly where that was. So anyway, just thought I'd... Um, 
update you on that that was a little bit of a rabbit hole i went down but it was of interest to me and it might be of interest to some of the rest of you so in, in way of updates for today starting with the seismic data uh, over the last 24 hours i'd say it's largely unchanged if we look at the magnitude 2 and larger quakes we can see that the the bulk of those are occurring north of grindavik um, and so they're around this this hill or area here called Hagafel. Um, and so a lot of twos here, a few other twos up here further up into the crater system. Um, and this is where some folks are thinking, you know, at least based on the data we're seeing right now, if there's going to be an eruption, it's likely to be here. I'll kind of come back to that later because there's, there's I've listened to a couple of different geologists and, and their opinions at this point and we're, there's no real consensus, I think is, is the bottom line. So. The seismic data remains largely uh, similar, uh, no threes over the last 24 hours. If we look real quick here at uh, the last, let's say, I don't know, six hours or so, there's just been one, two. And if we look at all the quakes over that six hour period, uh, again, you can see the, the dominant trend here, that north, northeast, southwest trend, similar to what we've seen the last few days. So that looks pretty similar. Um, Okay, other kind of news that has happened uh, since we last chatted yesterday. And if you hear a lawnmower outside, they're mowing on campus today. So I apologize for that if that comes through on the microphone. Uh, they have continued to construct the, the wall slash berm slash dike uh, embankment, whatever we want to call it, around the power plant in the Blue Lagoon. That work's going on. They're working 24 7. Um, no, you know, doing it as quickly as possible. I haven't heard anything about a timeline or an estimated timeline for when they think they might be done with that. I would guess it would take several days, maybe a week or more, just based on the progress we saw the last few days. But the other interesting thing I heard from, I think it was a spokesperson for their civil defense agency, is that the plan, they are in putting together plans for doing something similar for uh, Grindavik. And so they are looking at preventative measures, barriers, structures, if you will, that could possibly divert lava around the town. Now, I don't know exactly what those plans are, uh, but right now the priority is the power plant, uh, which makes sense because this thing supplies the entire peninsula with water and power. And so that's the primary concern. And then once they get that completed, if there's still time, they'll turn their attention to the town and trying to put together some sort of mitigation measures in that area as well. Um, let's look at the update from the Met Office. Uh, this is as of today at noon uh, local time. So it's a few hours old. Uh, still a high probability of a volcanic eruption. So the seismic activity keeps going. About 2,000 earthquakes over the last 24 hours. Again, most of those have been pretty small. And most of those in that area I highlighted near Hagafell, um, most are small. Uh, but they did have one earlier this morning that was a magnitude 3, apparently. Um, all the GPS data shows that the ground deformation keeps going on, but it's not going as quickly. So the ground is not changing um, slope, if you will, as quickly as it was otherwise. Um, if magma br manages to break its way to the surface, it's still most likely to be in that area, referring to Hagafell. So right now the Met Office, if they're um, needing to guess or to make a prediction as to where the eruption might take place, uh, they're thinking that same area that we've highlighted, uh, more or less just due east of the power plant. Uh, the sinkhole above the magma tunnel is still active, so that's the, the, the down-dropped area right above the the magma body the dike um, although measurements show that subsidence is slowed down so that's good news that's good news for Grindavik uh, if we can get the subsidence to slow and or stop uh, I think that's good news moving forward and so yeah it's it's show, slowing down uh, it was up to five centimeters I think or so a day and now it's only three to four so this is all Good news, and again, based on all their calculations, model, and data, as of this point right now, there's still a high probability of a volcanic eruption, and the most likely source is north of Grindavik near Hagafell. And so that's that's what they're saying on that end. 
Um, now, there's a lot of different hypotheses that are out there, and so that's just one. Uh, if you listen to some of the other geologists in Iceland, it may sound and seem um, a little bit confusing, but this is, you know, what would be interesting is, is to know, you know, and I think with IMO, I, I get, I agree with them that right now the data is showing that this area is showing the most signs of unrest. And so right now, I would agree with them that that's probably, you know, if you had to choose a place that a eruption is most likely, that makes the most sense to me too. Um, but in looking at some of the other folks in the area, there's some differences, and I'll get to that here in a second. A couple other pieces of data here. This is from Ruve. Um, so uh, someone at the uh, Christine Jones' daughter of the Icelandic Met Office believes that the most likely scenario is an eruption that will begin in the next few days. And so I think what, what we're seeing is like, even though to the casual observer, it looks like this thing is winding down. We had the big earthquakes. There was a little bit of subsidence. There's cracks in town, um, but you're not seeing a lot of action. And so your instinct is that, well, it's, it's not going to happen. But again, as geologists and people who look at the data and monitor these types of things, this is fairly normal behavior for volcanoes, for there to be these lulls in activity. And those lulls don't necessarily mean that the end is coming in terms of not having an eruption. Sometimes there's lulls and then those are followed by uh, eruptive events. So uh, magmatic gases, we looked at that yesterday. Um, there was some power outage in, in parts of Grindavik, but that was... Uh, turned back on um, they've got a bill supporting residents so that's good news and that the bill should guarantee residents wages for the next three months so it sounds like they're moving forward on taking care of these displaced evacuees so that's great news um, lots of you know details there and uh, that's probably a bit of a mess um, we're going to stick to the geology mainly though there's still a high probability of an eruption it's not certain when and where it may happen and that's probably the best bottom line that we have um, another news item here and these are all from today no sign that the magma corridor is getting longer so that actual intrusion of magma that propagated towards the surface and got pretty close we don't have any evidence seismic or gps that's showing us that it's actually increasing its length so that's good news. Um, let's see, I can't remember if there was any good quotes in here. They, they mention uh, Benedict Gunnar Olfugsen, Um and he had some quotes in here. I just can't remember if there was anything, yeah, super noteworthy. But basically saying the same thing, probability can't be estimated. The magma is still pretty shallow. We just don't know where it's going to go, if it's going to go anywhere. Um, and then let's see this i found pretty interesting too so this is um same news organization talking to a different scientist so volcanologist harald dur sigurdsson uh, believes that there is if there is an eruption in the next few days it will be out in the sea southwest of grindavik and so um this is interesting because this is what i had talked about on a previous update is if we're going to have if there's going to be an eruption in the area, the best case scenario, I thought, was something out here. Um, I think worst case scenario is lava that takes out or, or compromises the power plant and the town. Uh, if it's below the power plant, it might just affect the town. But a ocean eruption here, even though it would be more explosive, you wouldn't have lava going into the town and lava and buildings um, it's a it's pretty obvious who's going to win that fight the lava it will destroy the buildings it will bury them they will be completely uninhabited or an un, uninhabitable excuse me if you have an eruption out here in the ocean though that will produce explosive conditions it's going to generate lots of uh, steam ash depending on the winds some of that ash might blow into town and you would get ash fall in and around the town but that shouldn't severely damage the buildings. That's something I think you could probably recover from a lot more so than if you had lava coming into uh, the town. And obviously, if you had ash in this eruption, could that affect air, air traffic and the airport a little bit? It could. Uh, it could, you know, shut down or, or delay or compromise air quality and air traffic for some period of time. But it probably wouldn't go on that long. 
Um, and that's probably a minor disturbance compared to the lava flows we might see here. So, um, and I also listened to, so he, that's his opinion that that's where he thinks the eruption would be. Uh, and I'm not sure what data helps him come to that conclusion, but we'll go ahead and respect that as a possible hypothesis because it is, it's very much on the table. Um, and then I listened to a, a radio interview on Ruve English Radio as a podcast, I suppose, with uh, a professor, let me get his name right, uh, Thordarsson from the University of Iceland. Uh, he's pretty pr uh, prominent in that area. And he actually confirmed what I was saying, which was kind of helpful to me to, to hear someone else corroborate my opinion that the this ocean eruption would be the one of the best case scenarios for for Grindavik. Uh, he also thought that it was about a 50-50 chance of it erupting. At this point, he was saying, well, 50-50, it's going to erupt, it's not going to erupt. Um, and so those were just some hypotheses or some opinions that were thrown around there. And so um, anyway, for what it's worth. Um, okay, so that's mostly the update for today. I want to finish this video with a little bit of education, um, education that I learned on my own and I want to share with you if you, hopefully you find this interesting and so I looked a little bit more detail into this whole um, sort of dyke Graben not so much the names we talked about that yesterday but the process a little bit and I have a little bit more understanding of it now than I did previously so I thought I'd share that so the idea here is is the the magma body the dyke so there's the magma rising to the surface remember that the rocks above it are brittle they're um, they're cool relatively compared to rocks that are much deeper and as this dike moves upwards it actually compresses the rocks around them uh, creates a zone of compression and so that means that the rocks above it on the sides of the dike in the adjacent areas are trying to move away from that compressive region and so what you end up with are these these faults or these fractures what we call uh, t tension fractures, or I think we called them, what did we call them yesterday, tectonic fissures, similar sorts of things. So there's the grob and there's the down dropped area. There's some of the cracks or fractures running uh, parallel to the dike. Uh, but I, I read this article, a couple articles that helped me understand the process a little bit better. So there's one little diagram that might be a little bit helpful as to how this kind of all looks in terms of like a cross section view. Uh, another article and diagram that was a little bit helpful. <clears throat> this one probably doesn't really pertain as much to what's going on in Iceland because there's a couple of variables we don't know. But this article I read talked about how there's a relationship between the width of the dike. Uh, if it's a large, if it's a wider dike um, and it has more pressure. And I'm not sure exactly. I didn't quite see in the paper how they estimate prior to eruption how much pressure there's going to be but if you're shoving a lot of gas rich magma into the crust you're going to generate lots of earthquakes <clears throat> excuse me so that's what a lot of these little um, diagrams here are you're going to end up with more ground deformation at the surface as opposed to a much uh, less pressurized less volume i suppose of magma that makes a much smaller dike um, and so they, they argued that th they could see this with modeling and then they could check that with some recent eruptions um, that there was this relationship between the, the width of the dike and its pressurization and ultimately how it erupts, <coughs> excuse me, at the surface. Um, and then um, I wanted to bring this up as, as, a, as an interesting point. There's also, you know, not all dikes make it to the surface. Here's a nice example here of a dike. This is cutting these pinkish rocks here are actually deposits of ash from some older event. Uh, but if you look near the top of it, it actually kind of tapers down and ends. Whoops. Sorry about that. Before it gets into this older dark lava flow. So this is not connected to that. There's actually two different dark rock bodies in here. And so these are what we call arrested dikes. This is in the Canary Islands. And so this magma has propagated up easily through these pink ash rich rocks, what we'd call a tuff. But then when it runs into these much harder, stronger, uh, more resistant rocks, the dike actually died out a little bit. And so as we consider what's happening in Iceland currently, 
uh, and this sort of will it or won't it dike is it going to erupt is it not going to erupt let's remember that um, it's moving through rocks of different types if you actually were to go back to um, this paper and I don't expect you to but if you actually go back to this paper on borehole 26 and you go to the end here uh, let's see it's not quite at the end it's near the end they have a if I can find it here we go somewhere in here let me see if I can find it while I'm talking they have a well log so they actually have a a there we go so this is actually as they drilled this well in 2015 or whatever year it was um, a record of the different types of rock that they're going through so from 8 to 10 meters lava and they have a description uh, scoria um, but what you'll see here I think if you just kind of peruse this is it's not all the same stuff the rock that they're drilling through with that borehole changes some of its very dense resistant strong lava other times because these represent previous eruptions some of which were on land and some of which occurred beneath glaciers so they were explosive and those explosive eruptions produce a lot of fragmented material that we call uh, a breccia other places it might be called like a hyaloclastite if you ever see that or tough in this case and so these types of rocks tend to be a lot softer and less resistant so now imagine that that dike coming up and it's running into this highly layered section of rock and it's running into rocks that in some layers are very strong and robust and difficult to break through so they have a higher sort of sheer uh, stress level if you will and then other layers that are quite easy easy for it to move through and that might be what we're saying seeing right now is our our magma body underneath um, this portion of Iceland just it's close to the surface and it just lacks a little bit of the buoyancy or the pressure if you will to make its way to the surface and so it's a bit of a stalemate right now the the magma you know will rise if it's less dense and more buoyant than the rock that it surrounds and even though it broke a lot of rock with those big earthquakes we had about a week ago and it made a lot of space for itself it still hasn't made space upwards to the surface it still hasn't made a nice easy conduit that it can travel through uh, or propagate up towards the surface and that might be why it might be running into a few rock layers in there that are just a little bit stronger than the strength of the pressure in the magma itself so it it very likely could stay there and and for a while uh, the other option might be that as more magma gets injected into the system that magma will have greater buoyancy more dissolved gases and that magma may provide the the extra little oomph if you will that allows that magma to break through the last bit of remaining rock to the surface and trigger the eruption and once the conduit is built that's when the eruption can proceed um, largely unencumbered for some period of time and so that's that's the waiting game that we're having right now so hopefully that was helpful a little bit of insight there into kind of how these things work a little bit um, I think that's good for today but I will try to put together another little video um, that answers a lot of the questions that were submitted in the comments on the previous two videos. I'll compile that, try to put that out in the next day or two. Uh, will I be with you tomorrow on Saturday? Um, uh, only if there's something newsworthy. If everything is exactly the same as today, um, then it doesn't make sense to, to put together another update. So assume that that's the case. But if I do have another update, that's that means that I've got some new data, something for us to explore and share together. So hope you're all well. Hope our good friends in Iceland are well. Um, hang in there. It, it could be a long one. It could be a grind. It could be, um, it's definitely a wait and see game right now. I know that's not what people that have been evacuated want to hear, but that's the best we can do as, as, as people, as a community, the best we can do is just monitor the situation, make the best decisions, <clears throat> excuse me, that we can. And hopefully all our proactive measures are going to be the, it's going to be the right decision no matter how this plays out. So um, yeah, so I think that's it till next time. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the support and encouragement. Uh, all you can do to help me put these together, take some time and effort, but I'm happy to do it. So thanks so much and we'll see you next time.